Oh, that sounded like uh, well, you meant it. <laughs> I hope you uh, meant it out there in TV land, those of you who are worshiping with us. Uh, it's, it's good to be here with you. It's good to know that God is with us. Yes. It's good to know that God is in us. Yes. And because he is with us and in us, we can behave ourselves. Yes. Huh? Yes. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yes. want to uh, lift up in prayer uh, those families in my home state of Kentucky. Uh, preferably in Hazard, Kentucky, a family that lost four of their children. Four of their children. Uh, it's ironic, however, that's where my family was born, and they were ran out of Hazard, Kentucky uh, from their property. Who knows uh, what God has in mind. It is our prayer that God would uh, be with and provide comfort yes. to those folk. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for our Bible text, uh, Matthew the 11th chapter, which will be the uh, main part of uh, uh, the sermon text, the 25th verse. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for your love for us. Sometimes the way we act, we realize that we are not worthy of your love. Because you deserve it. You are God. And you are God alone. And so we come to you thanking you for all your goodness. For your mercy unto us. Oh God, we lift up in prayer those family in Kentucky. Oh, particularly be with that family that has lost so much. Oh, give them comfort, oh God. Be with them. We pray for them. And, and, and we, we, we give them to you knowing that only you can provide what is necessary. Bless us today as we praise you, as our praise team comes and give you the glory yes. and the honor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen. Yes, Lord. Yes.
the best of your service. Yes, sir. You've been telling the world yes, sir. that the Savior has come. Yes, all right, man. Be not dismayed when men don't believe you. Yes, Go to the court.
the Lord for who he is. Man, the choir has been singing this morning. I, I was here Thursday night with them for a choir rehearsal doing some work, and I, I thought we were having church then in choir rehearsal. Yeah. Just what you have heard this morning, they sang with that same passion and dedication and praise to the Lord uh, last Thursday night. Well, uh, y'all bear with me. Um, you heard me say last Sunday that um, uh, uh, Creflo Dollar takes about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, but, but this is the last Sunday before vacation. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm going I'm to I'm give it my best. But, yeah, 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 but I don't think it's going to be an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I, I was up before five this morning, which is unusual. And my mind was on being here, not on vacation. Uh, somebody said that I looked like a peach. Maybe I ought to head. <laughs> Maybe I ought to head to Atlanta. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. But we'll see. We'll see what the Lord says. I want to uh, conclude our um, little mini series that we were doing on having a correct spiritual focus. We've looked at passages from Philippians. Um, and we looked at passages uh, last week from Matthew chapter 6. And today, I want to stay in the book of Matthew, but I want to focus in on what I'm saying or what I'm calling a formula for a proper focus. A formula for proper focus. Uh, as you can see, I am wearing eyeglasses. Many in the room are wearing eyeglasses. And it's always amazed me when I go to the eye doctor uh, from the time that I was about 11 right on through earlier this year, how the doctor can help me see better, help me focus. And it took years of practice in med school uh, for that doctor to be able to sit you in that chair, put drops in your eye, dilate your eye and then tell you I'll be back in 10 minutes and then they look in the back of your eye trying to make sure that there is no disease and then they want to check your vision. They want to see how well you see. And when they do that, they, they, they put different lenses in front of your eyes, don't they? And, you know, put this one in and then the other one. Is it better at one or at two? Is it better at B or at C? You know, and if I do this, I mean, some some lenses flip back and forth. The other ones slide up and down. There's a formula that they are using to help you see better, to get you right where you need to be. And, and bless the Lord over the last four years, my prescription really has not changed. I thank God for that because I could keep these glasses and not have to pay $600 for some more. And so, so you know, uh, I thank God. He's a keeper. <laughs> he even can keep your vision. And then not only will he keep your, your physical vision, he gives you the formula so that your spiritual vision can also be kept by him. Remember, we looked at from Philippians where Paul said, I've learned how to be content in every situation. Amen. And then he follows that up with saying, I can do all things. I can I can be content mm -hmm. in every situation through Christ who strengthens me. And so we've, we, we viewed some passages on wealth and the wealthy. And I, I don't really want to spend too much time on that today because um, I want to get to this passage in Matthew chapter 11. It seems as though people have lost their vision. People have, have lost their focus. And, and I don't know if, if they're listening to the Lord when he says, is it better at A or B or one and two? Sometimes our vision is, uh, is so messed up that we think that what we see that's out of focus is in focus. Now, there are many times when I am 
uh, watching TV and I am playing a game on my phone, that my glasses will rest like this. I'm nearsighted. I, I can't see things that are far away. Uh, I can see things that are close up. And so when I'm sitting there and I, I've got my phone in my hand, I'm concentrated on my phone. That's why I want my, vi my, my focus and, and my vision right down to my phone. Because see, my arms are long enough. I can adjust it back and forth. But when I look up at the TV, some stuff on the TV is out of focus. It's a little fuzzy. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We, we, we say it's blurry. But because I can hear the TV, the focus at, oh, let, me, let me see y'all, the focus at the moment <laughs> of the TV screen is not that important to me because what I'm, I'm focusing in is on the phone. I can hear the TV. But then when something real important comes on the TV, then my glasses drop back down. And thank God for modern TVs and, 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 and uh, cable and YouTube TV, because you can always do what? You can back it up. I can back it up 15, 30 seconds if it's something I really missed out of focus. I can get it in focus and get what I'm trying to learn from that. But do we back it up when the Lord is talking to us? When he wants us to focus on what he wants us to focus on. So today, as I said, we want to conclude this, this little mini-series on having a correct spiritual focus. If we spend much of our time pursuing riches and wealth, uh, that's going to wear us out, y'all. Remember when we looked at Proverbs 24.3, don't wear yourself out trying to be rich. Uh, there are lots of people who make money and wealth and even the pursuit of happiness, the focus of their existence. Uh, and, and they tell you that if you're going to achieve something in life, you've got to give up some stuff. You've got to cut some stuff loose. And, and basically what they try to tell you is that it's not an easy undertaking to try to achieve wealth and happiness. I've heard people go so far as to say, I work hard. So I play hard. I, I, I'm going to take it easy later on, but right now I'm working hard to achieve the goal. Well, I don't understand working hard and playing hard. Because when I work hard and I want to stop working hard and I want to take a vacation, I want to relax my mind, I don't want nothing hard about that. That's why I don't like driving any more than four hours anywhere I need to go. Now, we got a truck driver sitting here. George, George, George would drive from here to Maine if he had to. I, they just came back from, from Texas, just driving the whole way. So I, bless your heart, George. That ain't my testimony. Four hours and I'm done. I mean, if I got to work during my vacation, it's not a vacation. <laughs> So I don't understand. I don't, I don't understand. I work hard and then I'm going to play hard. Here in Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11, thank you, uh, Elder JT, for reading these for us earlier. But in verses 28 through 30, he's given us what I say is the formula on how the life of of his followers are to be lived. Okay. How we should focus is a formula. Let's read verses 28 through 30 again. Come to me, all, who, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Like I said, the formula. Jesus has exactly what's tailor-made for each one of our lives. There's a basic science to getting your eyeglass prescription correct, but they tailor it to you. There's a basic formula for a life, and Jesus gives us that formula. 
And he can and he will tailor this formula to you. Let's pray and let's unpack these uh, short verses here. Father, we thank you that we are in your house, that we could come and we could worship together. Lord, that we can praise you together, that we can hear from you together. Lord, it is not I who am the important one. It is you. So I pray that our focus would be on you and your words on today. Speak to our hearts and guide our lives from your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus says in this passage, the first part of the formula, the first ingredient to the formula is to come to Jesus. He says, come to me. Come to Jesus. Coming has this idea of moving towards a defined place. Uh, if the Lord wills, this week I plan on going to Maryland, if the Lord wills. That's a defined place. And then my wife asked me this past week, she said, and when we leave that, <laughs> where are we going? Now, I'm not going to lie to you, I got a little bit perturbed because she know I don't want to drive over four hours. <laughs> she knows that. But I don't have a defined place after I leave Maryland. The defined place for me is always H-O-M-E. I just love home. <laughs> I, I like being home. That's why I pay the mortgage. That's why I pay the utilities. That's where my bed is. And I don't have to spend $150 a night. Yeah, yeah, that's what hotel rooms are running about now. I like home. That's my defined place. But Jesus says don't come to just a defined place, but come to a defined person. Come to him. He didn't say just come. He said, come to me. We, we, we need to approach Jesus rather than some abstract notion or some thought. People have an idea of who Jesus is and what he requires, but we need to come directly to him to find out what he requires of us. Not only does this word mean come, but this word also means to follow. So when one comes to Jesus, one has to understand it that it's much more than just standing in front of Jesus. It entails following him, doing what Jesus requires of us. God knows that sometimes I just don't want to do that. I just want to be there. Lord, can I just get your, your, your blessings without having to do anything? I don't think I'm the only one that's like that, though. Can I just come to you? Why do you want me to love my enemies? <laughs> Why do you want me to pray for those who despitefully use me? Lord, why can't I just come to you and just enjoy you and forget everything that's out there? Come to him means I got to tell other people about him. Following him means that I've got to do his will rather than my will. Following Jesus says that when he says go left, I don't keep going straight. Mm -hmm. Following Jesus means I'm going to have to give up my rights. Uh oh, I got to give up my personal rights. Mm -hmm. Because my personal rights oftentimes clashes with his rights. Mm -hmm. Remember how Jesus called his disciples and what was his call to them? Come what? Follow me. And a disciple is, is a learner. A disciple is a student of a teacher, of the rabbi. And so Jesus is calling us to come and come and learn from him. Following also implies going along in the same direction. <laughs> if we're going to follow the Lord, we got, we got to take the same route. We got to take the same path. Sheila, uh, uh, the other day we were at a funeral and we had to go out to the Veterans Cemetery out in Suffolk. Y'all know what it's like going out there, don't you? That's a ride and a half. 
But thank God that everybody in front of us had their flashes on. And they were following the sheriff's deputies and they were following the, they were following the funeral directors. And we got there. But see, when I left there, I had to come back to the church. That's what GPS is all about. <laughs> And so I put in the general direction that I wanted to go, and, and my GPS wanted me to go this way, but I didn't follow the GPS because I knew generally where to go. It was going to take me all the way around the other side of Suffolk to get back to Churchland. So I said, I'm going to just wing it. I'm going to look for landmarks. But I didn't follow the GPS. Sometimes we know where we're going, but if God, if Jesus wants us to go the long run. Uh -huh. right. Oh, now. Hmm. We got to go the long route. Yes, sir. One of my nephews was in the family processional, not too far behind the family car. And someone in the car said to him, Tattoo, rather than going that way, go this way. And so Tattoo went that way. And when he went that way, then he got... Mm. <laughs> We better, better be careful who we listen to when we're supposed to be listening to Jesus. There, there, there are other folk who will speak into our lives. <laughs> I, 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 I have issues with folk trying to speak into my life. When, when Jesus tells me to come to him and follow him because if they speak into my life and what they speak into my life does not line up with the word of God it doesn't line up with Jesus Christ yes, and that's just like me going my own way and if I go my own way then I got to deal with the consequences yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jesus says come to me follow me take the same route that I'm taking and not only does this mean to follow and take the same route, following also involves keeping pace with the leader. You ever been following anybody? <laughs> In your car or on a path, on a bicycle, Cheryl? You know, you ever been following somebody? And they're moving too slow for you. You don't like the pace that they have set. Jesus sets the pace for our lives. And sometimes he ain't moving fast enough for us. And so when he's not moving fast enough for us, what do we tend to do? Then we want to outpace him. And when we outpace him, now he's the follower and we the leader. And I got news for you. Jesus is never going to follow you based upon your desires. He said, come to me. Sometimes we too slow. We don't keep pace with the Lord. <laughs> we lagging behind. Uh, I'll tell you, one, 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 one of the things my wife uh, has to remind me often is that, Stephan, when you get, when you lead somebody somewhere and they don't know where they're going, you can't drive but so fast. But now, now I, some of y'all might be like me. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not, now, don't, don't follow this example, but, but you know what it's like when you get to a yellow light, right? <laughs> when, 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 when I get to a yellow light, a yellow light is a caution light. Yes, a yellow light is not red. It doesn't say stop. It says prepare to stop. And so when I get to the yellow light, I keep on going because it ain't red yet. But if I got somebody behind me, mm, and I'm like, well, baby, they ought to just keep up with me. Why are they 15 car lengths behind? They know there's lights on this road. But aren't you glad that Jesus ain't like that? Huh? But, 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 but we got to keep pace. We have to keep pace with him. The second thing Jesus says here after he says, come, then he says, take up. And he tells us what to take up. He says, take up his yoke. Now, the, the take up seems to us it, it would be pretty straightforward what he means by taking up. But taking up means to 
pick up with the, with the intent to carry. Pick it up. Many of us will pick up stuff. Many of us will pick up our Bible. <laughs> and we'll, we'll carry it from the bedroom to the bathroom to the kitchen to the living room. But all we do is we carry it. How many times do you remember having that little Gideon's New Testament? Yes, sir. You had it in your pocket. You had it in your purse. And you were carrying it from one place to the other. But how often did you open it? Why were you carrying it? What was the intent? Was it to read it? Then to obey it? Or was the intent just to carry it around as a good luck charm? I, I'm just, I'm just, Jesus says, take up. Take up. With the intent to carry. And he tells us what to take up. His yoke. And you know, a yoke is, is, is that frame that draft animals. I don't mean draft like you're drawing stuff. And I don't mean draft in the bar where you get your beer. It's, it's these animals that, that, that are pulling on something. They're pulling a plow or they're pulling a, a wagon. A yoke ties two or more animals together. But generally it is two together for a common goal. Now, Jesus says, take up my yoke. In other words, become John with me. Hook up with me. Pick up my yoke and then get hooked up with me. What we want to try to do sometimes is we want to pick up what we want to pick up. And then we want Jesus to come yoke up with us. That's not what he said. He said, and take up my yoke and you get yoked up with me. I'm giving you the formula on, on how to have the correct spiritual vision here. I, and this formula comes from Jesus. Come to Jesus, take up his yoke, and then be joined to him. And watch the third thing that he says here. What's the third thing? Learn. Learn from me. I think the King James may say learn of me. You can use either one of those prepositions, but I like the one here. Learn from him. We, we learn from so many other sources. We learn from our mamas, from our daddies, from our teachers. We learn from the gurus. When are we learning from Jesus? What did Jesus say on this subject? Or what did Jesus say that I might be able to apply to this subject? Because he's got, the, he's got the formula so my vision can be right. If, if, if what somebody's telling me, if they're saying try one or two, here's what Jesus has said, and his is always one. <laughs> his is always in focus. And so if their one or two or their three or four or 10 or 15 does not match up with his one, and then, then, I need to stay with the one because that's, that, that's where I get the best vision. That's where, that's where I see correctly in, in, in focus. Be instructed by Jesus. He says, learn from me. Be instructed by me. Discover me. Discover from me. So many times we want to discover. You know, I, I've been watching a little bit this week, Shark Week. Y'all been watching some of the Shark Week? <laughs> <laughs> It's, 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 it's interesting learning about these sharks. And it's even on the Discovery Channel. You know what I'm talking about? And so you, you learn some things when you discover some things. And so learning about these sharks is just amazing. Very intelligent <laughs> beings. Jesus says, well, if I'm going to spend time and I'm going to watch two hours, three hours about sharks, what am I discovering about Jesus? to say that you can't learn about nature but I don't because when I'm listening to those shows and I'm watching those shows and here's what I keep hearing them say and this shark evolved to do this this shark evolved to do that this one evolved and so because I've got my eyes focused on Jesus and I'm learning from him and his word when the discovery channel says 
discover evolution. No, I know who created everything. I know who, who, who spoke things into existence himself. I can't get distracted. I don't care how often they talk about evolution. I don't care how much they talk about this, that, and the other thing just happening to how things are progressing this way or that way. What am I looking at these things through? Which set of eyeglasses? Theirs or my Savior's? Come to Jesus. Take up his yoke. Learn from him. And one of the things sometimes when we learn, we got, <laughs> some of it is learning by experience. Somebody said this one time that experience is the best teacher. I, I, I don't go along with that. It's a, it, it is a teacher, but I'm not going to say it's the best teacher. Because some things you don't have to experience. You will learn from an experience, but if you just simply obey Jesus, if you just simply follow his example, when my spouse gets on my nerves, mm, ha, what does he tell me to do? What was his example? Father, forgive him. Ah, for they don't know what they're doing. He didn't answer everything that, 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 that was asked him when they had him in that judgment hall. He just kept quiet. There's nothing wrong being quiet sometimes. There was a song that was sung and it said, he never said a mumbling word. Well, that song ain't altogether true. He did say some things, but he only answered what was pertinent. And we've got to learn in our relationships. <laughs> we got to learn from Jesus. To only say what's necessary. <laughs> it's a fool, the Bible tells us, that exposes <laughs> his whole mind. Just keep some stuff to yourself. Everything he says, everything she says, everything that child says, you don't have to answer back. Learn from Jesus. Get joined up, get yoked up with him. Come to him. Now, Jesus gives us some reasons why, why this formula works. He gives us some reasons why we should come to him and take up his yoke and learn from him. He says it's because the people to whom he was speaking, and I believe it can be applied to us as well, they were weary and burdened. They were worn out. They were tired. And, and, and they had fatigue. They were faint. They were troubled. You ever been troubled? They were beat down. One of the definitions for this word weary is weariness as though one had been beaten. Wow. Grow tired with toil to be physically and emotionally discouraged. Went out yesterday morning, made it my business. I wanted to try to be out there, cut the grass by 7.30. Didn't quite make it out the house at 7.30, yeah. Because that's, by law, that's when you can start using power tools at 7.30. And I knew that it had rained the night before and I knew the grass was wet. So I went out there and started to do the weed eating first to get the grass a chance to dry. I didn't get out there till 8.08. .08. But I wanted to beat that heat. It was hot. And, 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 and I got a phone call and phone calls kind of caught me in between weed eating and, and cutting the grass. And so I was on the phone for about a half hour and the heat picked up. But I had to do the front yard and the backyard yesterday. You, you ever been so, so tired that all you can do is just fall down? <laughs> You ever been out in the heat? I, I, I've been here at the church working, and I guess I probably shouldn't say this, but I've been here to, at, at the church working in, in, in the heat, out in the yard. 
And I've come into this room and turned the air conditioner all the way down. And I had to try to decide whether I was going to lay on the chair or lay on the floor. <laughs> I, 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 I was, I was so weary. I was so worn out. I had been beat down by the sun for so long. All I could think was which position do I get in? The floor was too hard. The chairs weren't wide enough. I was now emotionally worn out. Because I couldn't find physical rest for my soul. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean... Maybe y'all ain't never been there, but I'm learning as I get older, JT, the certain things I just can't do no more, man. I just, I can't come out here and do that kind of stuff anymore. <laughs> he says, you're weary. And not only are you weary, not only are you tired, not only do, uh, have you gotten tired from toil, he says, but you're burdened. You're overloaded. This, this is the word for cargo. I mentioned about Brother George driving a long distance truck. He, he drives a truck and they have those container boxes on it. And, and those of us that's ever been and you go past West Norfolk and you look over there at, 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 the, at the docks and you see all those containers and you've seen those ships that come in and they've got these containers stacked 15, 20 high. They come all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Some come all the way from the Pacific Ocean through the Panama Canal. And they come here with those boxes on them. And because it's got cargo in the boxes. But not only is that on the deck, what's down in the hole is a whole lot more. Kenny, you were a merchant seaman. You know what I'm talking about. And so when, when you got to deal with all that cargo, it takes men and machines to move the cargo. Jesus says your life is full of cargo. You are burdened. You got a bunch of junk. It's got to get unloaded. And so I'm telling you to come to me. Take my yoke. Learn from me. Get rid of that stuff. Or you will hoover the load. What, 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 what burdens are you carrying? You got burdens of sickness, burdens of family, burdens of money. What about the burden of the past? What about burdens of trauma? That funeral that we went to was for a, a nearly 24 year old army uh, veteran. Well, ain't even a veteran. He would have been clearly discharged on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Died before then. Left behind a four-month-old baby and a young wife. What kind of trauma is the family dealing with? Jesus says, come to me. Because you're worried. And you're burdened. You got cargo. You're, you're heavy laden. He said, I'm telling you why you ought to come to me. Because I'm gentle. I'm meek. I'm mild. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm quiet. I'm one who can compose peace. And I'm humble of heart. You know one thing about Jesus? He's unlike us in so many ways, and we need to be like him. Jesus is unpretentious. He makes no bones about nothing. He don't put on ass about anything. What you see is what you get. <laughs> he's straightforward. He's compassionate. Oh, come on now. <sighs> he ain't prideful. He's not arrogant. He says, I'm gentle and I'm humble. And so he tells us to hook up with him. Learn from him. Be like him. Come to him. And here is the benefit. <laughs> Here's the benefit of hooking up with Jesus. Is rest. <laughs> the benefit is rest. Your weariness, your burdens is rest. <sighs> 
I can't, I, I don't, as I, y'all, I've told you, I don't sleep well on, on Saturday nights and, and, and it's good that my vacation's coming up because I'm always anticipating being here on Sunday mornings. I'm, I'm always anticipating making sure that I've, I've spent time with the Lord and spent time in his word. I, I want to make sure the building is right. I want to make sure you're comfortable. I want to make sure, I got a lot that's going on in my hand and so on Saturday nights, I don't really want to go to sleep. I want to go straight from Friday to Sunday. <laughs> I do. Because I want to get this over with. Sometimes we have good burdens. But even when we got good burdens, we can go to Jesus. We can hook up with him. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to give us rest. (laughs) And he said if we take the time to learn from him, if we've come to him, if we yoke up with him, when we yoke up with him, and a yoke again, that's that implement that you put on two draft animals, he says, guess what? It's easy. That junk you got, that, that yoke that you, you, you're carrying, this, this desire to be number one all the time, this desire to achieve happiness apart from me, this desire to go out here and get the best of everything without talking to me, without learning from me. He said, you come to me, I, 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 I give you something to do, but it's going to be easy. It's going to be fit for use. It's going to be pleasant. And one of, the, one of the definitions of this word easy is, is good for its kind. Did you get that? Good for his kind. Jesus has a custom made yoke for you. It's good for you. It will fit you like it needs to fit. And so what, what, what farmers did, they would take an experienced ox and they would take a younger ox and they would put the yoke on the older, bigger, more experienced ox. It would basically rest on that ox's shoulders and neck. And the little ox would get in the yoke beside the experienced yoke. Uh, 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 ox. And, and, and though the yoke might have touched it, it really didn't touch it a whole lot. And so what was actually happening was the bigger ox was carrying the burden. Yes, yes. And so what the little ox had was, the learning ox had was, he was learning because things were easy for him. Yes. And as he grew and grew into the yoke, and the yoke fit him, and now the bigger ox, you know what he found out? This ain't so bad. He grew into the burden. He grew into the labor. Jesus says, you hook up with me, the big ox, if you will. And and you get in here with your little self. And 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 I'm going to carry the burden. And and you're going to grow into it and you will know that you got a load, but my load is easy. Mm. You can handle it because I'm with you. The problem is we're trying to live this life on our own and only bringing Jesus in when we get ourselves in trouble. (sighs) Yeah, we we, we got Jesus on speed dial. if, If you pull out your phone, most of the phones that you have, you look on the screen and you got your screen locked, right? And you got to put your code in, you got to put, you got to swipe it whatever way, you know, you got to unlock your phone. But there's a feature on your phone. It's 911. You don't have to unlock the phone for an emergency. And we got Jesus on 911. <laughs> we, we think we can just call him up. Whenever we want to, just because when we get ourselves, and one of the good things about him, he will come to our rescue. I don't, I don't know why he will, but that's the difference between him and me. He's going to come, but he wants us to learn. You don't have to get yourself in trouble. Because my burden is light. You know what the Lord said to the nation of Israel in Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31? Good, I'm going to tell you. He starts off with a question. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never grows faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. Look at verse 29. He gives strength to the weary 
and strengthens the powerless. Youths may faint and grow weary, and young men may stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will what? Renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. But you got to put your trust in the Lord. You got you to yoke up with him. Let him carry the, bu the burden, the bulk of the burden, and then let yourself grow in him. The Apostle Paul encouraged the saints at Thessalonica with these words. And, you know, he normally opened his letters with a prayer for those to whom he wrote. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, we must always thank God for you, brothers. This is right, since your faith is flourishing and the love each of you has for one another is increasing. He said, y'all doing good. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you among God's churches, about your endurance and faith and all the persecutions and afflictions you endure. You're going through something. You got a burden, he's saying. He's telling you, 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 you really having a hard time here. But he says, look at verse five. It is clear evidence of God's righteous judgment that you will be counted worthy of God's kingdom for which you also are suffering. You're going through because of God's kingdom. Sometimes, again, when we try to bring the Lord along with us rather than us going with him, we suffering because of our own mess. He said, but you're suffering because of the Lord's kingdom. He says in verse six, since it is righteous for God to repay with affliction uh, to those who afflict you. Don't try to pay him back yourself. Mm -hmm. Let the Lord handle it. And when you let the Lord handle it, look at verse seven. Not only will the Lord pay them back and to reward with rest you who are afflicted. And I like what Paul says, along with us. <laughs> the Lord going to reward you with rest, and he's going to reward us with rest. This will take place, I like this, at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels, taking vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Uh-oh, better obey him. These uh, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. In that day, when he comes to be glorified by his saints and to be admired by all those who have what? Believed. Because our testimony among you was believed. And in view of this, we all, always pray, also pray for you that our God will consider you worthy of his calling and will by his power, huh, you catch that? Fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith. You got desires, for, you got, uh, desires to achieve something? Get in God's will. Get in God's will. Get yoked up with Jesus. He'll bring it to pass as he sees fit, when he sees fit. Come on now. Verse 12. So that at the name of our Lord Jesus, uh, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified by you and you by him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The choir started off this morning singing a hymn from Fanny Crosby. She wrote that song. She was a blind lady. She was blind from about six uh, weeks old. Wrote hundreds of hymns. And this song, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross, was published in 1869. She's talking about rest beyond the river. Yeah, the day is coming, as we just read from Paul, that we're going to have some rest when we get beyond the river, when we get to that place where Jesus is. But I'll also like what another hymnologist wrote, one by the name of David, who was the king of Israel. Y'all know what David said in Psalm 23, and I'm going to read it to you from the home. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I like. He, watch this now, lets me lie down. Okay. He lets me lie down <laughs> in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet. Well, don't that sound like rest and peace and tranquility to you? 
And not only that, he, he renews my life. He renews my strength, the NSB says. He leads me along the right path for his namesake. When I'm hooked up with him, I can't go nowhere but where he's going. Your, you know, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now, verse 6 is real important. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. This is how some people live their lives. And I will pursue goodness and faithfulness and money and career and fame. That ain't what, that ain't what David said. He says, when I'm hooked up with, with, with the good shepherd, when I'm hooked up with Jesus, because I won't lack anything, if I, if I just let him be my sustainer, goodness and mercy, they're going to be pursuing me. They're going to be chasing me. We got it backwards. I learned this psalm when I was a child. My mama made us learn this when we were little children. Psalm 127. Look at verse 1. For those who are trying to make things happen on their own, you may want to commit this to memory. Unless the Lord builds a house, <laughs> its builders labor over it in vain. The King James says, except the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Watch the next thing. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays alert in vain. In vain you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Ah, here, here's where we are. And yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. Yeah. Folk wearing themselves out trying to achieve things in this life and they don't have any rest. <sighs> Jesus says, come to me. Yoke up with me. Learn from me. And I'm going to give you rest. This morning, part of my reading, and I think the Lord woke me up early this morning, because I don't normally read my, uh, through the Bible on Sundays to Sunday evenings. And in today's reading, it was Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah was the prophet to Judah before Judah went into captivity. And the Lord says a lot of things to them about how evil they were and why he was sending them off to a strange land. But in verse 13 of chapter 6, he says, For from the least to the greatest of them, talking about the people there of Judah, everyone is making profit dishonestly. From prophet to priest. Everyone deals falsely. They have treated my people's brokenness superficially, claiming peace, peace, when there is no peace. Trying to give people false rest, <laughs> false tranquility. Verse 15, they are ashamed. Were they ashamed when they acted so abhorrently? They weren't at all ashamed. They can no longer feel humiliation. Therefore, they will fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they will collapse, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient past. What was right way back when? I mean, you know, I know some of the things that our grandparents, great-grandparents, we don't do anymore. Some of it was wrong, like putting butter on a burn. Dermatologists will tell you that's probably one of the worst things you can do to put butter on a burn. But you know what? That's what they did. And so that was wrong. But there's a lot of good stuff they told us, wasn't there? Put a hat on your head when it's raining. Put a hat on your head when the sun is shining. Keep that. I mean, they told us a lot of good things. And so the ancient things that are true, he says, hang on to that. Which is, and here's the ancient past that he talks about, which is the way to what is what? Good. Then take it. When you take the ancient path that is good, what is, what's going to happen? What's the benefit? And you're going to find rest. 
for you. I mean, I, I, this morning I was like, okay, God, I got you. I got you. you. You will find rest for yourselves. Now, here's the sad thing. But they protested. When I told them what they could do to remedy their life's problems, how they would find some rest and peace, they protested. They said, we won't. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen for the sound of the ram's horn. But they protested. We won't listen. I don't want y'all not to listen. Matter of, matter of fact, I want you to listen. I want you to listen that we will focus on Jesus. That he is our good shepherd. That he is our perfect example. He is our peace. He's our God. He's our leader. He's the one who guides us into righteousness. He is our provider. We need to hook up with him and join with him because he's our way maker and he's our contentment. And he's also the center of my joy. He, he should be. and He's the center of my joy. Come on, choir. He, he, he's the center of my joy. and He should be the center of your joy. We talked about Fanny Crosby and her being a, a songwriter. We talked about David and David being a songwriter. But, but, but there's, a, there's a guy by the name of Richard Smallwood. And Richard Smallwood wrote a song a few years ago. And, and, and he took this idea of the Lord being my shepherd. He took this, this idea of God being good to me, of God giving me rest, of, God, of me hooking up with him. And he put it to the words of this song. And, and the song is, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Now, I'm not going to give you all the words, but, but we ought to draw near to Jesus and we ought to hook up with Jesus because Richard said, all that's good and perfect comes from you. You got some, some evil in your life. You got wickedness in your life. You know that don't come from the Lord. I like what he says. He says, you're the heart of my contentment. Hope Hope, the expectancy of all I do. Everything you do, do you do it with God in mind? Are you looking through the glasses that Jesus has provided you so you will have the correct focus on life? I got to catch myself so many times when I'm riding in the car. My mind goes everywhere. You ever been that way? And you're like, what in the world am I thinking about? You are the heart of my contentment. Hope for all I do. Richard said, when I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. And then he says, you are why I find pleasure in the simple things of life. Are we finding pleasure? Do we have pleasure in the simple things or do we always have to get more and more, grander and grander? Can we just be satisfied with who Jesus is? The choir is going to sing. Father, thank you for your word, for the encouragement of your word for the joy we find in you and in your word. I pray, Lord, that our focus would be on you, that you would adjust our focus, that we would learn from you, that we would be hooked up with you. Lord, there may be some who are listening, who are watching, who don't know you. They have yet come to you. I pray that on today they would come to you by faith and they would receive the joy that you provide them. They would receive the salvation. I pray, oh God, that they would recognize their sinful state. They would turn away from that. They would repent. And they would turn to you and make a commitment to live for you every day. This we ask in your name. Amen. Jesus. You're the center of my joy All that's good and perfect comes from you You're 
the heart of my contentment Oh, for all I do Jesus, you're the center of my joy When I've lost my direction You're the compass for my way You're the fire and light When nights are long and cold In sadness You are the laughter That shatters all of my fears when I'm all alone Your hand is there To hold Hold Jesus You're the center Of my joy All that's good And perfect Comes from you you're the heart of my contentment. Hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. You are why I find pleasure. In the simple things in life You're the music In the meadows And the streams The voices Of the children My family and my home You're the source and finish Of my heart Yes, dreams. Oh, 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 oh Jesus, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. The center, the center of my joy, of my joy. Jesus, Jesus, you are, you are the, center the center of my joy, of my joy. Jesus, Jesus, you are, you are the center, center of my joy, of my joy. you're everything, Jesus. everything. Everything of my joy, of my joy. You're my hope Jesus. in time of sorrow. You are. You're my joy for oh, tomorrow my when I'm down Jesus. and feeling sad. You are, you are the lifter of my head. My You're my music. Jesus. You're my song. You are my hope all day long. You are my joy in time of sorrow. You're my hope for tomorrow. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy.